Okay, so <clears throat> as, a, as a side note here, uh, just going to come back into Genesis just for a minute. I, wanna, I just want to, because you're probably wondering about some other covenants that I skipped over. Yes, there, God did cut a covenant with man, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, cut a covenant with Abraham, another blood covenant, right? It was a man, it was a covenant with, with Abraham with a man, okay? So um, it's, in, it's in Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. All right, so there, there is a covenant cut between God and between Abraham. And those covenants are in effect even for the children after. The only way that the covenant can be broken is if one of the covenant partners completely dies. So now, the head of the, co the, 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 the primary covenant maker, you know, cutter, now with Jesus, is on the earth. Think about that. When God cut a covenant with Abraham, he was in heaven. There was really no way to release them from that covenant. There was no, they, they, his, the children would never be able to be released from that covenant. Because it's for a lasting generation. Right? But now, one of the original covenant makers is on the earth. In the body of Jesus. Because the life is in the blood. So, if, if, if you are familiar uh, with the scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That starts to make sense now. Because now you understand the covenant partner is on the earth. And he is going to release. He's not destroying it. He's going to release those who by faith believe in him will be released from that other covenant. That's why Jesus said, a new covenant. I give you a new covenant. Because he supersedes the old covenant because he's the original covenant partner. He has the authority to be able to do that as the original covenant partner. And if you look at this in a couple of different realms, I mean, this is really some, some pretty deep meditation stuff. Not only that, he's a man. He's a man because he's God and man. The covenant is completely, he, is the, he bears the entire covenant upon himself, if that makes sense to you. Because he's God and he's man. The covenant was struck with God and with man. So now he is the, the complete package all rolled up in one. Man. Yeah, so, for, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip a lot of really good stuff about, about Jesus' you know, life and ministry. From, from birth to his suffering, we're going to pick up from his suffering. And I don't call it the crucifixion. Because you're going to see here, it wasn't just that one event of the crucifixion. Jesus systematically, you'll see through his suffering from the, from the time, we'll call the suffering from the time of the Last Supper, through the time when he was risen from the dead, we're going to call, call that his, the, the period of suffering, right? So three or four days. Because he systematically, because of his blood, y'all, he systematically breaks curse after curse. And we're going to lift out and look at, we're going to look at a, at a couple of them. So Jesus has the last supper with his disciples. And, um, and he goes to the Mount of Olives. And he knows, he knows what's about to happen. He knows what's going to happen. So he begins to, you know, his soul becomes to be distressed, right? You, 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 gotta, you gotta remember, he's man, he's a man. He has all the emotions that you have. 
He just learned how to control them. He was tempted with, with, he was tempted with depression. He was, he was, you know, with fear. He, would, he was tempted with all of that stuff, all of that stuff that you've been tempted with, except he never submitted to them. He was a man, you have to understand, he was a man, he was fully man. The only thing that was different about him and you was his blood was perfect and holy. And it was the very blood of God. It was the very blood of God. So, so, so Jesus is in the, in the, in the, in the um, Mount of Olives with his disciples. And you remember the story he tells, he, all of his disciples go there and then he takes Peter, James, and John, or uh, um, I can't remember, three of the disciples um, with him, Peter, John, and James. was it James? Peter, James, and John, I had it right. So takes them with him and then he tells them, okay, wait right here, just watch and pray. And then he goes a little bit further and, and he kneels down, you know, next to a rock and begins to, begins to just pray and, and pour his heart out to the father. You know, we've had that. I, I don't know about you, but I've had some things that have just been distressful in, in my in my life. And just, you know, you just get along with God and just break. Like God, I just don't understand. He understood. He knew, he knew, he, he knew exactly what was going to happen. But he, he wanted this. He wanted to do the will of the Father, but who wants to be humiliated and beaten and pierced and shamefully hung on a cross naked in front of everybody? I mean, of course he was in distress. Even with the love that he had for, for not only man, like men and friends and people that he knew and just the love that he had for humanity, but the love that he had for his creation. So he's, he's in agony. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So before I take it from there, that is a medical proven fact that when you are under a tremendous amount of stress and agony, like Jesus would have in that situation, your, the, the capillaries in your forehead and on your head can burst. And you can literally bleed off of your face from severe stress. Medically, it's proven. So Jesus is under this agony and begins to literally sweat blood. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 19. Some of you may already know where I'm going. Then Adam said, then, he, then to Adam, this is after Adam and Eve uh, were disobedient and they disobeyed God and... Um, now God pronounces a curse on them. The Bible says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field with the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. Somebody see that? By the sweat of your face, and the ground is cursed. Jesus, by the sweat of his face, broke the curse on the ground. Hallelujah. Think about that for a minute. Yes, amen to that. Thank you, Jesus. By the sweat, the blood that, that, drained, that dripped off of his face and touched the very earth because it was the same earth that that blood created. He was God. He was God from the beginning. He was God in heaven. Jesus was God in heaven in the beginning. All things were created through him and without him, nothing was created. It's in Hebrews. 
Jesus, his very perfect, untainted, holy, alive blood fell to the dust of the earth and broke the curse on the earth for anybody who will believe. <clears throat> so, the blood of Jesus broke the curse on the ground and he was God and God was the only one who could break the curse on the ground. Man couldn't break that curse. Only God. That's why it was important. See, we look at these stories in the Bible and we think that they're just insignificant. I mean, how many times have you read over that story about, about Jesus sweating blood in the garden and you just didn't really think twice about it? You thought, oh, man, that's, that's brutal. A poor guy was under a whole bunch of stress, sure. But you didn't realize that, that simple little thing, that little fact that the... That, that, that the, that the of the gospel reveals to us in Luke, it, it clearly points to the fact that what Jesus did was so thorough and complete that he left no stone unturned. He left no place that we wouldn't get deliverance. It was complete from the beginning of his suffering, from his very birth, through his life, to the, from the start of the suffering to the time of the resurrection. And the time that he went into that throne room, he completed it. Nothing left. Let's look at another one. <clears throat> so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to him, Behold the man. What did they put on his head? A crown of thorns. Let me reread for you Genesis chapter 3. So it says... And like verse 18, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. He again, systematically, is breaking the curse that he pronounced on mankind 4,000 years earlier. Think about it. Those crowns of thorns went into his head and produced blood. When that blood was spilled because of those thorns, God now has purged it and cleansed that part of the curse. And so we can look at these stories throughout the Bible, throughout Jesus' sufferings and, and, and crucifixion, and we can see, we can see that Jesus, with his blood, systematically broke every curse so that you and I can walk totally free from anything the enemy wants to throw at you. Amen. And you know what, what, what strikes me too in this? I know that, you know, Jesus had said, you know, on different occasions that he was king and all that kind of stuff. But these, these, these soldiers, you know, I think they knew in their hearts that he was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They were doing it mockingly. But how many of you have been, as a Christian, have been mocked by an unbeliever and you knew when they mocked you that in their heart they're, they're, they're trying to protect themselves from the conviction that's happening in their heart. Do you know, have you, do you know what I'm talking I can't describe exactly what I'm trying to say, but you understand. You know what I'm saying, right? You know that they know that you, you're right, but they're mocking you to, 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 to like make themselves feel better. Yes. See, I, I feel, I believe those soldiers, they knew in their heart. Well, we read that in Romans chapter one at the very beginning of the message. We read that God has revealed himself to them and so they are without excuse. 
They put that robe on him, and in some of the accounts it talks about they put a reed in his hand. They put that crown of thorns on him, not knowing, not even knowing that they were, that they were, like I said, God plays the long game. They were playing right into God's hand. When they put that crown of thorns on Jesus' head, they played right into God's hand. Because God said, I need to break the curse of the earth, and I cursed him with thorns, that thorns and thistles, so I need to break that part of the curse, so I'm going to put some blood on it, and I'm going to break that curse. Those, those soldiers, when they were mocking and they put a purple robe, they were actually just showing, they were showing the powers and the principalities, though they didn't realize it. They were showing them, yes, this is the King of Kings, and this is the Lord of Lords. Yes. Though they mocked him, though they mocked him, in their hearts they knew. They had to have known. <clears throat> okay, so... So let's, let's, um, let's fast forward to the, um, to the crucifixion. So we, we know the story, and I'm not going to go because you've probably heard it a, a whole bunch of times, maybe thousands of times, about, you know, by his stripes we're healed, about him being broken and, and whipped and all that kind of stuff. So you, you've heard that. You've gotten revelation on that. I want to go. I just want, I'm not even going to touch that. I'm going to leave that. You know that. And if you don't know that, you need to, you need to, Start researching it and finding out that and start meditating on it. But we're going to go to the time when, G okay, now Jesus is up on, um, he's up on the cross. And he's in the throes of death. Right? And he's beginning to see, as he dies, he's beginning to see into the supernatural realm. And you're familiar, you're probably familiar with, the, with Psalm 22. In, in Psalm 22, it says, the opening of Psalm 22, verse 1, the opening of that psalm says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Isn't that exactly what Jesus said on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and, and I believe Jesus was, was quoting scripture, but at the same time, he gave, that psalm was written by David. He gave David those words to speak because David knew somehow Jesus, in Jesus before he was in his earthly body, you know, the pre-incarnate Jesus spoke that word into David's heart. David wrote that psalm. Maybe he saw the cross. Maybe he didn't. He spoke those words, but Jesus first gave him those words only to repeat those words that he gave them to him earlier while he was on the cross. Do you understand what I'm saying? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So then it goes to, in Psalms chapter 22, verse 12 and 21, Jesus now is on the, on the, in the throes of death and he begins to see into the spiritual world and it says, many bulls have surrounded me. This is verse 22, or I'm sorry, verse 12. Many bulls have surrounded me. It's very interesting. What did, the, what did the children of Israel, when Moses went up on the mountain to visit with God for 40 days, what, and he came back down and he threw the tablets down because what did he see? A golden calf. A, golden calf, a bull. A, an, a god, an idol that the children of Israel had put up. A demonic, a creation of a demonic being. What is Jesus seeing here in verse 12? Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. What did the Bible say that Satan goes about like a roaring lion. seeking whom he may devour? A raging and a, Jesus is now on the cross in the throes of death or maybe this is after death. He is now seeing into these demonic entities that think, that think they have won. I love it. Think about it for a minute. In this political climate we're in, yeah. they think that they have won. Like a raging and roaring lion, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. 
It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot sheared, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. I believe not only the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, it wasn't just the people that he saw, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the people put him to death, but he's seeing. I'm sure that every demon that is on this earth came rushing in thinking that, the, that, the, that God, the Son of God, was now being destroyed, which was exactly what they wanted. They were all watching thinking again that they had won. <laughs> the Lord laughs at them. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. So we can see that Jesus is seeing into the demonic realm. And now, if, if you look, particularly in the New King James, I think it does it in the King James too, that there's one last phrase in there um, there's one last phrase in there that I did not read on verse 21 the last part of verse 21 I don't know if the guy said it up here or not the last part of, and I'm not going to read that because I believe and this is important I know this is controversial um, but you, you can just hear me out and if you don't believe it then you can you can study it out and prove why you don't believe it but I believe Jesus went to hell I believe Jesus went to hell. I believe those demonic forces that were around him, um, I believe that those demonic forces carried him off into the pit of hell. Now, they, let, me, let me just read. They carried Jesus off to hell and the covenant partners humanity tasted hell remember the part of jesus that was deity was his blood his blood was left on the earth his humanity his body and his soul went into the pit and felt the very horrors of hell. His blood, his deity, was still on the earth. Remember, remember, God said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the earth. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the earth. Jesus spilled his blood on the earth. But his humanity, his soul, tasted death for you and for me. The punishment that we deserved. Now, the, the, the most amazing part of Psalm 21, as far as I'm concerned, is the end of verse 21 and the subsequent verses. Here's what I believe happened. Jesus was in the pit of hell, and whenever the, whenever the Father have, have, has felt that the punishment was enough, obviously, it was after three days, right? Then Jesus, the Father, knew, or I don't know how, I don't know when Jesus knew. It was this time. But there was a time when Jesus... The Bible says, you have answered me. The end of that verse, verse 21, you have answered me. And then it goes into this whole bunch of praise. I believe the way Jesus ended up being delivered from heaven was through praising his heart out. 
It was finished now. You have answered me. You have heard me. I have paid the price. And now I glorify you, my Father. You are amazing, God. And the moment he began to praise the Lord, the very, the very gates of hell couldn't prevail against him. The very gates of hell could not contain him. And he burst forth out of the gates of hell after three days of being in there, being punished. The very original covenant partner is alive again. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> The original covenant partner is alive again and he stopped as he's coming up out of the center of the earth. He stops by and he grabs his body. Think about that. You know, the Shroud of Turin is a very interesting thing because the Shroud of Turin, it, the, the, the reason why that impression is on the Shroud, how many of y'all know what the Shroud of Turin is? Okay, it's the burial cloth of Jesus. Okay, that they still have, that the Catholic Church has somewhere, uh, you know, and, and that, that burial cloth, they did studies on it. They did a whole bunch of scientific studies on it um, where they were handling it and stuff. It wasn't just kept in a glass case. That, that, that shroud of Turin, the way it was made was like a negative of a picture. It was made from light emanating underneath that cloth that it made a negative, not from the light above it, the light from under the cloth emanating. When Jesus swept into his body, all of that light that he produced made an image on that piece of cloth, and then he took that cloth off and he folded it up and put it on the bed. You know, every good boy makes his bed. He took that, folded that cloth up and put it at the foot of the bed, and they, you know, they still have it today. It's just another indication that God is light. And in him there is no darkness nor shadow of turning. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus picks up his body. And now you remember the story. You remember the story. <clears throat> Jesus, um, he goes, he's, 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 he, he just decides he's going to take a stroll through the cemetery there. And happens to see Mary. Right? And she thought he was the gardener. And then when he said her name, she said, he said, she said, Rabboni, or, or, you know, master, teacher. And he, she knew who it was. It was Jesus. She knew it. He said, don't touch me, Mary. Don't touch me yet. I have not yet. I have not yet. I have not yet ascended to my father. But go tell Peter and the other disciples. Think about that. He hadn't been yet up into heaven. She, she couldn't touch a sacrifice because it would, you know, you, you weren't, only the priest could touch the sacrifice when it was time, right? So, so he's, he's on his way fixing to do something pretty, pretty powerful in the throne rooms of heaven. So let's, let's just picture that just for a minute. Then we're going to do communion here at the end. So here we have it. The Bible says, had they have known, they would not, speaking about the demons and the, and, the, and the enemies of the Lord, had they have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, when, 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 when Jesus was crucified, nobody knew. I believe that not even the angels in heaven knew the importance of Jesus spilling his blood, of one of the covenant, original covenant partners spilling his blood. I just want you to, I want to burn that in your memory. The original covenant partner. I, there wasn't, I don't think, and even the angels in heaven, I don't think they knew the importance of what had just transpired on the earth that it would change the course, not of just humanity, but the course of the universe and what God had planned. And God in his infinite wisdom and his beautiful long game, what he had done. And I believe, how many of y'all are, are familiar with the prodigal son? 
Everybody knows the prodigal son story, right? I'll just give you a quick overview. So the prodigal son goes into sin, right? Goes, he, he wants his inheritance from the father. The father gives him his inheritance. He takes all that money and he goes to a faraway country and he spends it all and blows it on harlots and women and drinking and, and carousing and and you know right and so now he's all done with that and, and he wastes all of his father's money and and he and, and he and he's like living like a hog you know eating eating the hog's husks and and working for a really hard guy a, a hard master working for a hard master we know that we've played that game yeah. i've served the devil before and it sucks he's working for a hard master and then <clears throat> And then finally he comes to his senses, and so he decides he's going he's gonna to go back home. So when he was a long way off, when he was a long way off from the father's house, the father was waiting for him on the porch. Think about it. He was gone for years. That father sat on that porch every single day looking out towards that horizon, hoping, believing, praying that his son would come back. So when his son was a far way off, that, the father stood up and ran after him. And, and, and he ran after him. He finally, got to his, he finally got to his son. And his son just says, Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I'm, I'm an awful, basic, I'm paraphrasing. I'm an awful person. I don't deserve to be your son. Just, just call me a servant and that would be fine. I'll serve you the rest of my days just as your servant. The father didn't even acknowledge his sin. The father says, stand him to his feet. Get those dirty clothes off of him. Go get him a robe of righteousness. Go get him a robe of honor. Put a ring on his finger. My son who was lost is now found. Now, back to the throne room. So here comes Jesus. Remember, had they had known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. None of the angels knew. Here comes Jesus. All of heaven. The Bible talks about revelations. In Revelation. That there's a moment of time when all of heaven is silent. I believe when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords walked into the very throne room. As he proceeded to, to work his way through heaven. Heaven became completely silent. Now you have to remember. One of the covenant partners is back in heaven. And he looks different. He's got a body. And now this covenant partner is beginning to walk his way through heaven with his blood in hand. And as he walks through heaven and, and gets close to the throne room, heaven just goes silent. Because they don't know. It's only in the heart of the Father and in the heart of the Son as to what was happening. And so he walks into the very throne room of God where the mercy seat lies and the father stands up to greet his son. And he says, take those filthy rags off of him. Bring him the robe of righteousness. Put a belt of truth around his waist. Put a ring on his finger. My son has paid the price. And now he shall reign with me in glory forever. And so, amen. And so Jesus, Jesus walks, Jesus walks into that throne room and he takes his, the father stands up and steps back and the Jesus walks into the throne room with his blood and he sprinkles his blood over that mercy seat. He sprinkles his blood over the chair. He sprinkles his blood all over that throne room and, 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 and the father sits down and pats his hand next to him. And Jesus takes his rightful place at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. A man at the right hand of God. That has sprinkled his blood, his perfect blood. The second person of the Trinity the, the, the Trinity is again united as three. But the difference this time is the Trinity looks a little different. The Trinity has a man as part of it. You know, Jesse Duplantis tells a story about his, vis his, his, his visiting heaven. And he said... 
Um, how many of y'all know, you've heard the story about Jesse visiting heaven? Okay. So Jesse was translated into heaven for a period of time. And when he was there, he said he saw the Father and he saw Jesus. And he said that, that Jesus, he said it's hard to describe, but Jesus just came out of the Father. Like, like he was just part of the Father. Well, what did Jesus say? I and my Father are one. So now, the tri- do you understand how important you are as a human being? And even, even more than that, even, even above that, that you are one of his children. You know, I love children. I just think they're, I like kids. Kids are awesome, especially good kids. <laughs> right? I like kids, right? I mean, they're just awesome. And my son is in town visiting here for, you know, for a week or so. And, and, and he's, he's, he's 30 now, and so he's older. But, but I still just, I just adore him. You know what I mean? I mean, he's just an awesome, he's just an awesome kid. And, and I love all kids. But there's something about my babies that I love. That's even more. You know, the Bible talks about in Romans chapter 5, I believe it is, that if God treats the sinner this way with this kind of love, how much more does he treat his own children with that love? How, how, how much more? You, I know probably all of you love kids in here, but your own children, there's just a special place for them in your heart. You're one of his children. He's got a special place in his heart for you. And, and, and what Jesus did for us and in the manner in which he did it is remarkable. That the, that the God of the ages, like we read in the psalm, the God of the ages would come down, or in Micah, I'm sorry, the God of the ages would come down and become a man and look so and be so much of a man that without spiritual discernment, you, did, you thought he was a man. God did that. That's amazing. And God in his infinite wisdom, and by the power of his own blood, by the power of his own blood, he redeemed you and me. God himself redeemed you and me because of your value. Amen? Let's, let's take communion together, y'all. Okay. <clears throat> Those little things can be difficult to get open, can't they? Okay. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, go into it much about, you know, Jesus being bruised and broken. And, and, and I'm going to get a little bit graphic here, but did you know that when they would torture, really is what it was, when they would torture somebody at the whipping post, like they did Jesus, the, the taskmaster was skilled to understand when a person is near death. That's why the Apostle Paul got 39 stripes, you know, 40 stripes less one, which was 39 stripes. Because they had figured that 39 stripes was just about to the point where if we did one more, you'd die. They wanted to torture you to where you, to where you would be tortured but not die. And also, what they would do, they would use a cat of nine tails. They would take a leather strap, have like nine different strips at the end, They'd tie little pieces of bone or steel on the end of the cat of nine tails, and then they would whip 
The taskmaster, would, who would, the person who was tied up, sometimes they'd tie him low, sometimes they'd tie him high. When it was tied up, they'd run that whip across their back and pull it and rip the flesh of the back. They say that Jesus' back looked like, the, like an open can of tuna, completely shredded. The God of the universe, the God who created you and I, the God who created those guys, Pilate, who condemned him to death, the, the taskmaster who whipped him, created by God, created by Jesus. The, the one like us who disobeys when we know we're not supposed to. When we know we're not supposed to do something, we do it anyway. Direct disobedience. The God of the universe took that in his body, took the punishment, a horrific punishment for you and for me. And in all of this, after his back was opened up like a can of tuna, they nailed him to a cross. And the way you die on a cross, you have to understand, as I'm describing this, this is the creator of the universe. All things that were created were created through him. And without him, nothing that was created was created. This is the creator of the universe. His, his back is opened up like a can of tuna, and they put him on a cross. And the way you die on a cross is you die by suffocation. So you're hanging on a cross, you're stretched out like this, and your legs fall, and you can't breathe because it pulls your diaphragm up. So the only way for you to catch a breath is to push yourself back up. To breathe, only to fall again. Think about what his back felt like running up and down that old rugged cross. He didn't have to do that. He was God. He didn't have to do it. He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for us. By his stripes, you are healed. Lord, we thank you for the punishment that you took. Thank you for your body, Lord, that you subjected to the punishment that we deserved. Thank you, Lord, that you went to hell on our behalf. Lord, we see that. We, we have revelation of your sacrifice, Lord. We say thank you. Thank you for providing by your blood everything that we need. Thank you for the torture that you went through so that we could be healed, Lord, that we could have health in our bodies. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead and take the bread. Now, so <clears throat> you understand now, after this message, the importance of the blood of Jesus. That when we take this, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. When we take this blood, when we drink this as a, as a, as a remembrance of what Jesus did for us, I want you to always recognize and remember that it was the very blood of God. You see, because one man's blood is worth one man, right? One natural man's blood is worth one man. But what is God's blood worth? What's the value of the very blood of God? The very creator of the universe who spilled his blood as a covenant partner spilled his blood, what is it worth? Invaluable. It's invaluable. His blood. 
You know, we, 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 in, in, we in today's day and age, you know, different than 40 or 50, 60 years, well, probably 60, 80 years ago now. Back in the early days here in the United States, Christianity, man, they understood the blood. We'd have songs about the blood, about the power of the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Awesome. See, back in the old days, they knew about the blood. We've kind of gotten away from it. You can't get away from it. It's your very lifeblood. It's, it's, it's everything that you need. It's the declaration of God's victory on the earth. It's, it's all encompassing. encompassing. It, 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 it destroys anything that would come against you. It's his blood. It's what makes you right and holy and perfect. His blood. It's because of his blood that we live and breathe today. It's his blood. Remember it throughout the year. Don't forget it. Don't forget about it. Thank him for it. Thank him every day that he kid that God, covenant partner, became a man with his holy blood, and his holy blood redeemed me from the grave. There's two parts, you know, to the, to the communion meal. There's the, 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 the satisfaction of what we deserved in punishment for our sin. That's his body. All of the fiery wrath of God was poured out on the body of Jesus. And the Bible says in, in Isaiah chapter 54, this is like the waters of Noah to me. As I swore that I would never flood the earth again, I swear to you that I'll never be angry with you again, nor shall I rebuke you. God will never be mad at you again because of the blood of Jesus. So he paid the price in his body and then he ushered in the new covenant. A better covenant based on better promises. That you now are partakers by faith. There's not a demon in hell that can stand against you. There's not a trial, there's not a tribulation that you won't come out on top. You're a winner. You're above and not beneath. You're the head and not the tail. You're blessed going in. You're blessed coming out. Amen. It's because of the very blood of God that was shed for you. Amen. Let's take this. Father, Jesus, thank you for your blood. Holy, perfect, amazing. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus, that we are the redeemed of the Lord. Help us to walk in such a manner that is pleasing in your sight. Go ahead and take the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, so today, you got some pretty heavy-duty meat. You got a freezer full of meat. It's going to take you a while to chew on it and, and, and devour it. And I would recommend that you spend some time. I only scratched, I didn't even scratch the surface. I just barely rubbed the fog off the window so that you can see a little bit further, right? So I would recommend that you just spend some time meditating on these things. Spend some time trying to understand these things. And, and, and God will reveal, I prayed for you this week a lot. And God will reveal to you, I prayed a lot for you guys. Everybody who's listening to me, I prayed for you this week a lot. And God is going to reveal to you some pretty spectacular stuff. I know it, I believe it. Do you agree with me? Yes. Amen. All right, praise the Lord.